So hello everyone, good evening. Uh, welcome to today's uh, talk by Professor T.P. Singh on quantum mechanics and gravity, introducing the IQ. Uh, just to say a couple of minutes, uh, just a couple of words about uh, today's speaker. He's a theoretical physicist at TIFR Mumbai. Uh, his research interests are in the quantum gravity and in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, he has recently proposed a new quantum theory of gravity. And today he will give an overview of this theory. So dear participant, so in this series, now this series has uh, become a stage where brand new physics ideas are actually premiered. So uh, we must all thank uh, Professor T.P. Singh for agreeing to give this uh, his talk in this series. Um, so with these few words, I now request uh, T.P. to start his lecture. Okay, uh, thank you, Satya. Thanks so much for uh, giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. I would also like to apologize for this delay and the little mess up. I'm new to Zoom, so I often get confused. So before I start, I just like to check with you, Satya, is the sound okay? Perfect. TP. Okay, so I will go ahead. I have only 10 slides. I'll go slow. And perhaps that should be done in half an hour or 35, 40 minutes. I think we have one hour in all total. Yeah, including questions. So but there will be, I'm sure, uh, quite a few questions. I hope to leave about half an hour, uh, hopefully in the end for questions. So, okay. so that we can have good discussion. So sure. the title of the talk you've already seen. And we are excited along with my collaborators about this new concept of uh, a particle, if you like to call it. of space, time, and matter, which helps us uh, uh, describe quantum gravity. So the, we, the claim is that the universe is full of icons, which at low energy look like the universe that we can see. OK, so let's get going. And now it doesn't let me change the slide. Oh. The right button should have worked, no? Hi, ah, yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, ah, yes. Now it's okay. Uh, so let me start by addressing this uh, century old problem in uh, quantum mechanics, uh, also often known as Schrodinger's cat paradox. Uh, as we know, quantum systems uh, obey this very beautiful linear superposition principle, namely, uh, if you have a solution of the Schrodinger equation psi 1 and another solution psi 2, the superposition is also a solution because uh, it's a linear theory. Uh, so this superposition principle is what allows us to observe the interference pattern when we say do a double slit interference experiment with electrons or with photons. Now, if we ask this question, uh, how large are the systems for which in the lab we have tested linear superposition? It works for photons, it works for electrons, for protons, for helium nuclei, for you know fullerene atoms, C60 that you remember, uh, which has uh, about 700 uh, particles, 720 AMU is the mass of fullerene molecule. We have observed uh, interference pattern with that. How high has it gone? There's a, a current world record uh, set by a lab in Vienna. Is 20, hello? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. It's 25,000 atomic mass units. are very heavy uh, clusters of molecules. So you can imagine you send a beam of uh, these heavy objects, each having about 25,000 elementary particles. And uh, each one, so to say, goes through both the slits proverbially speaking, and shows the interference pattern on the screen. Uh, so 25,000 AMU is big, but it is not big enough. You see, if you take uh, a piece of chalk or a dust grain, it has about 10 to the power 23 AMU atomic mass. That's the mass of a 
desk screen or you know you go up if you want you can talk of a chair or a table or a bottle of water so it is not as if everything shows uh, superposition it's there for microscopic system and obviously in, our, in the world around us we don't see superposition so if you take a bottle of water or a chair a chair is made up of elementary particles which individually all of them obey the superposition principle if you were to send those particles in at the beam one by one but suppose you send a bound state a 10 to the power 23 particle bound state chair uh, at least uh, to the visible eye does not show superposition we don't see a chair or a table in two places at the same time why should this be so this is our starting question and uh, you know this question is 100 years old it bothered schrodinger a lot he that's what he why he came up with the cat paradox and there have been many many explanations over the last century ever since quantum mechanics was born why does the macroscopic world around us not exhibit quantum superposition so one possible answer, so this is the question we are starting with. It, this is our route to quantum gravity. So here is one possible explanation. Uh, we don't know if this is the correct one. Uh, maybe some other explanation or some other interpretation is correct. Uh, the claim is not being made that this is the answer, but this is a possible answer testable experimentally that maybe we have to make a very small modification in quantum mechanics such that it works, the new theory works for small systems and becomes the same as quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics fails for large systems, whereas this new theory works in the following way, that superpositions do not last forever. If you look at the Schrodinger equation, it will tell you that a quantum superposition lasts forever. To forget the measuring apparatus, just take a solution of the Schrodinger equation, two solutions, superpose them. That solution is going to last till eternity. At least that's what the Schrodinger equation is telling us. What is the modified theory? Uh, it's called spontaneous localization. It says that superposition of two states of a microscopic system, like an electron or an atom, these superpositions are extremely long-lived. They last for a very long time t, say of the order of the age of the universe, 10 to the 17 seconds, but they do not last forever. So this is a very important, though tiny, departure from quantum mechanics. Microscopic superpositions are not eternal. They don't last for an infinite time. They last for a very long time t, and t is a new constant of nature. It's a new constant of this theory known as the theory of spontaneous localization, which was proposed by three Italian physicists, Girardi, Rimini, and Weber in 1986. It is then easy to show that if you take a macroscopic bound state like a chair, which has n particles, the lifetime of superposition becomes t by n. So if n is the number of elementary particles in the state, in the chair, say, so what was capital T? It was a superposition lifetime, let's say, of two states of a proton. If there are n protons in the chair, the superposition lifetime of two states of a chair becomes t by n. A chair can be here and there simultaneously for how much time? t by n. This is a property of the theory. Suppose t is 10 to the power 17 seconds, which is the age of the universe since the Big Bang. So superposition for two states of a proton as good as lasting forever. But look at what has happened to t by n t is 10 to the 17 divided by 10 to the power 23. It becomes 10 to the minus 6. That's a millionth of a second. So the theory of spontaneous localization says that on the average, a superposition of two states of a chair lasts for a millionth of a second. It's not that the superposition is not there. It's very, very short-lived. 
so so that it's not perceptible to the human eye and what happens after this much time t by n the chair collapses to either here or there in a process which we call spontaneous collapse or spontaneous localization so as you can see spontaneous localization is not a property of quantum mechanics in quantum mechanics t is infinite so t by n is also infinite what girardi rimini and weber did is came up something very clever made t finite but enormous so that t by n became very small now it turns out that the theory of spontaneous localization uh, makes predictions different from that of quantum mechanics for meso and macroscopic systems and the theory is now being tested in a few labs around the world is neither confirmed nor ruled out but it is one falsifiable explanation for the absence of macroscopic superposition so this was a hypothesis that uh, these physicists put forth in 1986 the hypothesis of spontaneous localization which is one possible solution to the schrodinger cat paradox uh, now comes the question which takes us towards quantum gravity what causes spontaneous localization in the first place if we can make a ad hoc hypothesis or uh, that of spontaneous collapse and we can test it in the lab uh, if it is confirmed very good we'll have to live with it it will become a part of the new theory we'll have modified quantum mechanics for large systems if it is ruled out then we go back to good old quantum mechanics and ask for some other explanation for spont for absence of macro superposition suppose spontaneous collapse is a property of nature then we are entitled to ask what causes it to answer that question i am going to shift gears and shift to a different problem a uh, not so well advertised as the cat paradox but a problem which to my understanding and to the understanding of many physicists who study quantum gravity a problem that is more serious than the schrodinger cat paradox and that is the problem of time in quantum theory so let me take a few minutes to explain what the problem is the time that we are used to is a part of a classical space time time is not a part of quantum theory it's not a quantum object we don't think of time as an operator and write commutation relations for time so time is classical in the sense we understand it's described by a real number the positive or a negative real number but time is a classical entity in the newtonian or the einsteinian sense now uh, we know that the geometry of space time is produced by classical bodies and classical matter fields according to the laws of uh, general relativity or newton's law of gravitation in the non relativistic limit there is an underlying space time arena a manifold which is uh, beneath the space time geometry the metric i do not make a distinction between the geometry and the underlying space time manifold for me they go together we can argue it uh, discuss it in the question answer session they go together so classical space time manifold is also produced by classical bodies but these classical bodies uh, lo and behold are a limiting case of quantum theory we need uh, uh, quantum theory to get to the classical limit in fact it is the absence of classical superposition which is not being explained by quantum theory yet we have a sense that large objects are made of small quantum objects so these large classical bodies are a limiting case of quantum systems and now it turns out that the space time which is being produced by these large bodies is hence a limiting case of quantum theory i hope you see the circularity in the argument large bodies are a limiting case of classic of quantum systems large bodies produce classical space time and hence classical space time itself is the limiting case of quantum theory now that is unsatisfactory a theory should not have to depend on its own limit 
for its formulation. So that's what I call the problem of time in quantum theory. There should be a way to describe quantum systems or microscopic systems without using classical time. So the goal of our project is to remove time and since space goes with time, remove space time from quantum theory. Now, those of you who have studied quantum mechanics in your careers, you have a feel for that space is not uh, so important for quantum mechanics. The action, the whole, uh, the play out happens in the Hilbert space. Whereas time you need, you need time very badly to describe evolution. Space you are not so dependent on. Still there are paradoxes like the particle that the wave function describes lives in space. With the state, the quantum state, the wave function lives in Hilbert space. So there's this dichotomy between space and Hilbert space, and we are going to get rid of that. We are also going to get rid of classical time from the formulation of quantum theory. That in fact takes us towards the new quantum theory of gravity. The act of removing space time takes us towards our new quantum theory of gravity and we get a nice result in addition. This new quantum theory of gravity predicts spontaneous localization. So remember a few slides back, we said that uh, Girardi, Rimini and Weber proposed the ad hoc hypothesis that spontaneous localization makes absence of macroscopic position superpositions. Now, where does spontaneous localization come from? To answer that, we said we need to remove space time from quantum theory. When we do that, we come to a new quantum theory of gravity, which predicts spont spontaneous localization. That completes the circle and makes the new theory quite believable. Okay, so what is this new theory? It is a matrix dynamics. Uh, so I introduce it to you slowly. Uh, think in your mind that you are doing classical Newtonian mechanics. Uh, you have an action principle, you write an action principle, you vary it, you get equations of motion. Inside the action principle, there's a Lagrangian, which is the integrator over, when you integrate the Lagrangian over time, you get the action. This Lagrangian is made of configuration variables, usually denoted Qs their corresponding velocities q dot dq by dt. And you have a polynomial in q and q dot, which you integrate over time to get the action whose variation gives you the equations of motion. Let us now do the following exercise. These q's I'm going to raise to the status of matrices or equivalently operators. I talk equivalently of a matrix is an operator and an operator is a matrix. Uh, in uh, Technically speaking, infinite dimensional matrices, but we won't get into that aspect right now, whether it's infinite or finite. We can work with finite ones and come back to this issue later. So suppose I have a Lagrangian in classical mechanics made of Qs and Q dots. Let us replace the real number Q by an operator or by a matrix. So Q dot also becomes a matrix. Q dot is the time derivative of each component of the matrix. So you, uh, if I just look at the equation in the last line, I'll give an example in action for a harmonic uh, oscillator, which is the in time integral of the Lagrangian, Q dot square minus Q square. Q is one degree of freedom, a real number. The, on the right hand side of the arrow in bold, I show the matrix Q. So bold Q is now a matrix. And, uh, but I don't want a Lagrangian to be a matrix. What I'm left with now is a matrix polynomial. Q dot square minus Q square is a matrix polynomial. I'm going to take its trace, take its matrix trace, the sum of uh, diagonal uh, elements. That is a scalar. The trace is a scalar. And I can arrange things, for example, that it could be a real number or it could even be a complex number. In fact, I'm going to work with the complex action. We ensure that the trace is a number. It's trace, uh, of course, is not an operator. Once you take a trace, you get a scalar quantity. So this new matrix dynamics, 
works with matrices. Now recall for a moment, quantum mechanics also works with the matrices or with the operators, but this is not how we do quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we raise Q's and P's, the momenta to the status of uh, operators, and we impose quantum commutation relations on the classical degrees of freedom. Here, what have we done? If you look at this arrow, the degrees of freedom are still Q and Q dot, or the corresponding momenta which you can get from the Lagrangian. We have given them a metric status in the action principle itself. And these are our new degrees of freedom. We are not going to quantize this theory. We are going to work with the equations of motion which come from varying this action. So this is in fact known as trace dynamics because of the importance of the trace. This was invented uh, about uh, 20, 20 years ago by Stephen Adler, who's now emeritus professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Adler's goals are very similar to ours. In fact, uh, my entire motivation comes from his work. I mean, I, I treat him, he's my mentor. Uh, I learned a lot from him. And uh, so this is our matrix dynamics. I am going to vary the action with respect to operator cues. The, so in trace dynamics, we have a uh, technique how to vary a scalar made from matrices, how to vary that scalar with respect to Q itself. So when you do the variation, you actually get a harmonic oscillator equation of motion for Q, Q double dot equals Q, but this is now an operator equation. The Qs and Ps do not commute with each other. That's the difference from quantum mechanics. We are not going to quantize the theory we are not going to impose quantum commutation relations. The commutation relations are determined by the dynamics. In fact, we are going to derive quantum theory as a limiting case of this matrix dynamics. So now let's come back to the beginning. This is an assumption we make that this new matrix dynamics, it operates at the Planck scale. Why Planck scale? Because that is where we uh, at least uh, in our minds expect quantum gravity effects to show up. And since we want this to be a quantum theory of gravity, we assume that it operates at the Planck scale. The fundamental entities of this theory are these entities called, which we have given this name, icons. What is an icon? An icon is a particle together with the fields it produces. So suppose what is an electron? We understand what's an electron. An electron produces electromagnetic field, it produces gravity. If I say electron together with its gravitational and electromagnetic and any other fields, I call that the electron icon. So in, in, in certain spirit, it's very much also like a closed string. In string theory, the closed string has different vibrations which dif describe different known particles as this mode. So in that sense, it's very similar, but the physics is very different. In string theory, we quantize the closed string. Here, I'm not going to quantize the icon. The icon comes quantized because it obeys this uh, matrix dynamics. So what is an icon? It's a particle together with all, and together with the space time, there's no space time. In this Planck scale matrix dynamics, these icons are matrices which live in a Hilbert space. They have a dynamics, which I'll describe in a moment. That will be a matrix dynamics with a known action principle. So I hope I've given you some flavor of what the new matrix dynamics is. It is a, it's like doing classical mechanics with matrices, but it makes a huge difference. It's not just a trivial repetition of uh, uh, you know, relativistic uh, classical mechanics. So there is a big difference, which I'll just come to. So what is this notation? We will assume that these matrices are made up of Grassmann numbers over the complex field. Grassmann numbers, as you know, are numbers which anti-commute with each other. If theta one and theta two are two Grassmann numbers, then theta one into theta two plus theta two into theta one is zero. That's a anti-commutation rule, unlike ordinary numbers. Uh, it turns out that if you take products of two Grassmann numbers 
and form a Grassmann number with an even number product, then that behaves like a real number. So if you make theta a equals theta one, theta two, theta b equals theta three, theta four, then theta a and theta b will actually commute with each other and behave like complex numbers. So every Grassmann matrix, Q is a Grassmann matrix, we split it as a sum of Q bosonic plus Q fermionic. This is what's done in field theory also, QFT. Q bosonic is, and you can do this for any matrix, just as any matrix can be split into its e, uh, uh, sorry, symmetric and anti-symmetric part. You can split any matrix, matrix into its bosonic and fermionic part. This is the name. What is a bosonic matrix? It uh, is made up of even number, even grade elements of the Grassmann algebra. That is, every element here is made from even number products of Grassmann elements, whereas a fermionic matrix is made up of odd number products of Grassmann elements. So every Q can be written as Q bosonic plus Q fermionic. So icon has every icon comes with a bosonic part and a fermionic part, but this is one entity. I made this split for convenience. As you can anticipate, the fermionic part of the icon describes the matter uh, uh, part like the electron and the bosonic part describes the fields. So this is in a sense a unification of matter and space time and Young-Mills fields also come in. So in that sense, an icon is an atom of space time matter because it comes as a combination of QB and QA, but we must remember this combination is for our convenience. This is the fundamental object. The fundamental object is neither QB nor QA, but Q. So at this Planck scale dynamics, Q does not have a definite spin. Bosons are half integers, sorry, integral spin, fermion are half integral spin. Q doesn't have any definite spin. In fact, the concept of spin does not exist at the Planck scale matrix dynamics, neither spin nor mass. Each icon comes with the associated length, which will denote L. And again, uh, notice how similar it is to a closed string in that. So you have a length scale associated with a closed string. So uh, Q comes with a length scale L or a equivalent area L square. That is the only parameter that a Q has. And now I'll show you the action principle for an IQ. So this is our fundamental starting point, this first uh, line. I should take, I'll take a few minutes now to explain this because everything comes uh, from here. So look at the overall structure. There is a trace inside these big braces. So there's in, sitting in here is a matrix polynomial. Huh? Uh, whose trace we have taken, integrated it over a time. Now I should explain what this time is. It's not space time. Space time has been lost. This object in here, it contains everything. It contains space time, it contains matter fields, it contains gravity. And uh, recently we showed it how to generalize this to include young Mills fields. So the action that I'm working with here has gravity and Dirac fermions, but we can add young mean fields also. I'll not go into that today. This uh, tau Planck is Planck time. This you are familiar with. Uh, tau is scaled with respect to Planck time. Now it turns out that this uh, matrix dynamics, because it is a non-commutative, it is essentially a kind of a non-commutative mm -hmm. geometry in the cone sense, in the sense of Alan Cohn's non-commutative geometry, there is a result in that in Cohn's theory that there's a natural measure of time which is which is reversible. Sorry, a reversible notion of time which maps these uh, Qs to Qs at uh, another point in the Hilbert space. So I will let I will not go into this right now. Please accept that there is a natural notion of time in this uh, matrix dynamics denoted tau and called Cohn's time. That's a name I gave it. Uh, so I, we call it Cohn's time. There's no space. There's no space. There's no classical space time. Classical space time is hidden here. 
So it's like as if you have come up with a fifth dimension, which is uh, uh, time-like in nature. S is the action. Uh, in fact, now a complex action, uh, not Grassmann number value, complex value, scaled with the constant C naught of the dimensions of action, which will later be identified with Planck's constant. So S over C naught is dimensionless. This is dimensionless. The trace is dimensionless. Now let's come over what is happening here. LP is Planck length. C is the ratio of Planck length to Planck time. So you could ask what is speed of light? What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything right now, except it's a ratio of LP to tau Planck. That's the definition of this of constant C. This is the fundamental constant L the length parameter or the area parameter which uh, we associate with the, the icon. So this is the only parameter that the icon has. This is the bosonic part QB. This is the fermionic part QF. Beta 1 and beta 2 are two constant self-adjoint uh, fermionic matrices. Uh, there are reasons why we needed uh, those matrices. Without that, we could never make an action. So the beta one is bosonic, fermionic, QF is fermionic. A product of two fermionic matrices is bosonic. So this entire Lagrangian inside the trace is actually bosonic. So we work with bosonic Lagrangians whose traces are complex numbers. So if you uh, scan this action, what does it look like? Well, think of the first term as a time derivative of uh, the icon's position Q. So this is Q dot, Q dot square. So you immediately can see that this is the structure of a free particle. You know, so when you're working with gravity, you know about the equivalence principle, a particle in a gravitational field is essentially a free particle. It's undergoing free fall. So this action has a very simple structure that way. It is engineered to be a free particle. That's what it is, a free particle in Hilbert space in the Planck scale matrix dynamics for an IQ. If you have many IQs, you would just uh, sum over the action for each of them to get the total action. The action is uh, additive. And uh, right, so the, an electron IQ would have some L, another IQ will have a different value of L. In fact, subsequently, we identify L with Compton wavelength. Also, okay, given this action, we can work out equations of motion. Those are actually a free particle equation of motion. Now comes the central uh, asset of this matrix dynamics, which makes it different from ordinary classical mechanics. Like I said, you know, if you're doing classical mechanics with this and you still get the same kind of equations of motion, you haven't gained anything. You're just doing mechanics with matrices. And that's not uh, very interesting. Here comes the conserved charge, which is not there in Newtonian's mechanics. It's a consequence of working with matrices instead of real numbers. And why is there such a conserved charge? It's denoted by this symbol C tilde, uh, first found by Stephen Adler and his student uh, Millard. So it's called the Adler-Millard conserved charge. It comes about because of a global unitary invariance of the action and the trace Lagrangian. So if you make a unitary transformation of over this QB over this QF, you can easily check here that because we are working with the trace, the unitary transformations don't change the trace and hence don't change the Lagrangian. The theory has a global unitary invariance because of the trace structure. Suppose these were not matrices, these were just numbers, like in Newtonian mechanics. The unitary transform is trivial. U, QB, U inverse is the same as QB if QB is a real number. Whereas if you make a unitary transformation of a matrix, you go to a new matrix. So uh, the, there's a non-trivial invariance which comes about when we are working with matrices. And then Noether's theorem tells you that there's an additional conserved charge in addition to the Hamiltonian of the theory. And that has a very elegant structure, which is the following. Suppose I labels uh, the different 
ions in the system uh, take their bosonic part qb of the ith uh, ion find the momentum from this action principle from the lagrangian variation take the commutator qi pi for the bosonic part sum it over take the anti commutator for the fermionic part f for fermionic sum it over and subtract it from the first sum this object is conserved the very beautiful uh, conserved quantity notice that it has dimensions of action it is coming from commutators that we are familiar with in uh, quantum theory anti commutator for fermions commutator for bosons but each one of these is individually not conserved the commutators and anti commutators are evolving because of the dynamics but their sum is conserved and we'll see in a moment what role it plays uh, i'll tell you right away in fact at low energies uh, we arrive at quantum mechanics and this conserved charge gets equipartitioned over all the degrees of freedom so c tilde was a constant it is equipartition so each one of them becomes a constant and the same constant and we call that uh, planck's constant or ih bar so planck's constant emerges as a equipartition of this conserved charge and that's also responsible for the emergence of quantum commutation and anti commutation relation so in that sense this theory is much richer than classical mechanics it's much richer than quantum theory and that's that's a good thing about this new matrix dynamics okay now we come to our last question what does the dynamics look like at energies below planck scale suppose i come to lab energies like a, a tv scale or a 100 gv i don't want to observe this theory at uh, the planck scale level of resolution i coarse grain it imagine uh, you are observing the icon not evolving over planck time interval but say evolving over a interval which is 100 times planck time interval so of coarse grain in the sense of uh, statistical mechanics or if you have a pollen grain in a glass of water then you are observing its random motion that's happening because you have coarse grain over the motion of the water molecules so it's in the same sense so what is the emergent dynamics i will not go into the mathematics there are two limiting cases case 1 if not too many ions are entangled with each other i talk of entanglement in the same sense as in quantum mechanics uh, if not too many ions are entangled with each other then quantum theory without classical time emerges so you remember what was our goal we wanted a description of quantum theory without classical time we get it here planck's constant emerges quantum commutation relations emerge because of the equipartition of the charge that i just heisenberg equations of motion emerge so this is one low energy limit of the planck scale matrix dynamics that is quantum theory without classical time what is the other uh, very important and interesting limit suppose there is a high degree of entanglement like you know that's what's happening in a chair for example there are 10 to the 23 ions which are entangled with each other that's what i call high degree or sufficient entanglement then it's a property of the theory that spontaneous localization takes place in the fermionic part the matter part of the ion gets localized its localization is what defines space and space time space time emerges from the collapse of the wave function so to say of the fermionic part that's how classical space time is a consequence of a localization of the fermionic part of the ions and whatever is not localized the qb part those are the fields which live in this space time so i hope you get some and we actually can show that in this emergent classical theory the laws are that of classical general relativity so there are two limiting cases of the icon dynamics one limit is quantum theory there's a microscopic limit what we really call microscopic is a situation 
where not too many ions or particles get entangled with each other. The quantum entanglement that we study is with not uh, with a large number of particles, 10, 15, 100,000. Here we are talking of 10 to the power 23. So there is something special. I can tell you how large is large. You can come back to that, but I want to leave some time for questions. So these are the uh, two low energy limits of the icon dynamics. If you take the space time provided by this part, case two, you can translate the quantum dynamics from case one to quantum dynamics on ordinary space time. Here it was without classical space time, yeah? But now that we have space time, we can translate from here to this space time background, but keeping the matter part quantum, that's ordinary, that's standard quantum theory or quantum field theory. So from this matrix dynamics, we can recover quantum theory without classical time. We can uh, recover uh, classical general relativity and uh, the laws of quantum field theory. Uh, so I'm going to skip this, uh, these two slides. Uh, just to quickly mention that there is a determinism underlying quantum in determinism. The matrix dynamics at the Planck scale is a deterministic theory. But because we have coarse grained over uh, Planck scales, the emergent theory acquires indeterminism as a characteristic feature. That is where uh, collapse of the wave function during a measurement comes from, because you are not observing the system over Planck scales. And there are some uh, predictions that were shown here. I'll leave this slide. For more details, you could please look up this uh, uh, link. Uh, and I'll stop here. I should have stopped earlier. I'm sorry. But we can have questions now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, TP, uh, that to make it uh, very, very crisp and concise, but at the same time, leaving it a place where I think uh, some discussion can take you through uh, the other concepts, which are probably uh, you. Uh, should I stop up. share screen now? Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah. If, if needed, I'll come back. Yeah, you can come back. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as it happens, so I request uh, the participants from the from the Zoom to raise their uh, hands, or you can also, of course, type your questions in the chat box. Um, and by the time I see some questions here, let me quickly go to YouTube. Uh, uh, there are quite a few questions. Interestingly, a lot of them from one uh, participant. I'm not sure if you know him or her. Know him, uh, Faber Bosch. Um, so there are quite a few questions. Let me take uh, one or two in the beginning and then come back here. What is the uh, what is the nature of constraint? What is the nature of the constraint on the spontaneous collapse theory from the modern observations? Uh, experiments, yes, yeah, right. Yeah. It's a very good question. So if you recall the new parameter that has been introduced in spontaneous collapse theories is this uh, superposition lifetime that are denoted by the symbol capital T. In quantum mechanics, T is infinite. The proposed value for this T, the superposition lifetime that uh, GRW, Girardi, Rimini, Weber gave is 10 to the power 17 seconds. So this has to be tested experimentally. The current experimental low, lower bound on T is 10 to the power 8 seconds. T is greater than 10 to the 8 seconds, according to experimental bounds. So we have still nine orders of magnitude to go before we can rule out uh, the GRW theory. Suppose you find experimentally a T value at 10 to the 10 seconds. That's OK. They are just saying that uh, T should be smaller than 10 to the 17 seconds in order to you know, explain absence of macro superpositions. If T goes larger than 10 to the 7, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19, the theory will be ruled out. So the current bound is 10 to the 8 seconds. Okay. Uh, maybe another question we'll take uh, right away uh, from the same participant. How timeless physics approach of the LQG uh, tally to your idea of uh, removing space time? Oh, very good, very good, good point. The thing is, uh, the main difference between LQG and loop quantum gravity and this approach 
is that LQG does not admit spontaneous localization. So how do they understand or explain the quantum to classical transition? So my understanding is one has to appeal to a interpretation of quantum mechanics as, for example, the many world interpretation or something uh, equivalent. The, uh, if you leave aside uh, spontaneous localization, the low energy theory that emerged, the quantum theory, also has a quantum description of gravity. And at that level, it might match with no quantum gravity. Except, so I, I have spontaneous localization, they do not. I have this cones time, which also they do not have. These are differences. Okay. Uh, we have one question from Shaikot Chakrabarti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Titi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, you said in one of the first slides that uh, classical space time emerges from classical objects, something like this, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, can you explain this point? I ah, mean, suppose, uh, motivate so go, this point. Yes, it actually goes back to Einstein's own thinking. Now suppose you, I give you an empty space time, like Minkowski space time say, how are you going to distinguish one point from another? You have no operational way of saying that this is point A and that is point B because those points are indistinguishable. This bothered Einstein also. So that is what led him to uh, propose that in order to make operational sense out of the underlying space time manifold, you have to overlay on it a gravitational field, a metric. Unless you have a metric sitting atop the manifold, the manifold is physically not meaningful. And what produces the metric? Classical bodies. So classical bodies localized in space are sitting atop this manifold, acting as markers. Now, suppose I did not have classical bodies, I had only quantum systems, let's say a universe filled with electrons. Now, electron is not a localized object. It has a state which is, so to say, spread over all space. So electrons are not markers. Quantum systems are, cannot be markers of an underlying classical space-time memory. That is the sense. Yeah? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Can, uh, okay. Can, yeah. we, can we move on? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Uh, so you can mute uh, your mic, which I did. Uh, I'll come back to, of course, uh, again, YouTube for a while. The, there are two related questions. Maybe I'll combine one from Faber and another one from Silesh Incha. So it says, is there any motivation for the name Ikeo? And uh, since Ikeo is the particle with its fields and the fields are a function of space-time, how is it independent of space-time? And is it a trace which makes independent of space? Uh, it's a good point. So when you first question, I can address right away. Uh, Aikyon, uh, I wanted something Indian or Sanskrit about the name. Uh, we just gave the name for the first time in our recent paper just a few days back. Uh, so as I said in the talk, uh, Aikya in Sanskrit uh, means oneness. Mm -hmm. So we are sort of bringing oneness to space, time and matter. A uh, goal which is actually quite dear to Einstein. We do not anymore make a distinction between space time and matter. They become the bosonic and fermionic parts of uh, this IQ. So now the second question, uh, which uh, let me try to remember what the question was. Uh, okay, this is uh, the second uh, part, which is uh, slightly, uh, it has multiple mm -hmm. parts. Since it is a, since IQ is a particle with its uh, field, Mm -hmm. uh, and the fields are, uh, you know, a function of space-time. So how yes, is yes. So, so that's a good point. I use the word field loosely. The bosonic part, I call it a field. Uh, strictly, I should not be doing it. You are right. Fields live on space-time. But here there is no space-time. Both QB and QF are our imaginations. All that we actually have is a Q. We have a Grassmann matrix. 
which for our imagination and convenience we have split into q bosonic plus uh, q fermionic for q bosonic to exist we don't need space time in fact space time is created when q fermionic is localized to one of the eigen values of the matrix qf so that's one what spontaneous localization does it sends a matrix to one of its eigen values yeah so i hope you get the picture suppose qf is the so called uh, uh, configuration variable describing the fermionic aspect spontaneous localization will send it to one of its eigen values those eigen values in fact become defining values for positions in space time space time is defined from the spontaneous localization of the fermionic aspect of uh, iq and once the space time is defined i talk of qbs as fields in the on the space this second part is a bit subtle uh, how the qbs become fields on space time so maybe you can email me please i won't be able to get into it right here uh before actually okay let me just ask you again a question since you are on matrices Uh, mm -hmm. QB and QF. The question is how the matrices QB and QF corresponds to the bosonic and fermionic statistics. Ah, beautiful, very good question. Uh, I'm actually thinking about it. So let's see what what do we have? QB is a bosonic matrix, meaning it is made up of even grade Grassmann elements. QF is made up of odd grade Grassmann elements. i have not talked of spin yes. in fact i don't know how to talk of spin that's one serious question we are working on if you have a matrix made up of even grade grassmann elements what we show in our theory is that it obeys a commutation relation q p commutator equals i h bar so when q b and its momentum are bosonic the commutator q comma p commutator equals i h bar is satisfied from here we would like to prove that there is something called a spin attached to a qb part of the icon which obeys both einstein statistics i don't know how to do this the thing is uh, you might say well in standard qft there is a proof lorentz invariance uh, supposed to imply you know both einstein statistics but we are not going that far we, we haven't even come to lorentz invariance we are given these qs and ps qb pb qf pf i would like to introduce a new definition of spin from here in the sense that you have an operator qb you have operator pb the corresponding bosonic momentum in ordinary physics we define in space time orbital angular momentum from the cross product q cross p yeah something like that or rather r cross p whatever you want it's like it's q cross p we don't know how to define spin we have no feel for how to define spin it just uh, is a conserved quantity that you have to add to the total angular momentum but here in this matrix dynamics we are god given q and p yeah the matrix dynamics come to the q p QB and the PB, QF and PF. I ought to be able to define something like a spin at the Planck scale in the matrix dynamics, which uh, I, then I need to show if it obeys, if QP obeys a commutator, the statistics is uh, symmetric states, and uh, and uh, anti-commutator, it is the anti-symmetric states, the Fermi-Dirac statistics. I don't know how to do it right now. It's on my mind. If you can prove it, great. Please uh, get in touch with us. Good question. Very nice. Uh, uh, we have still left some more questions on YouTube, but I came back uh, to Zoom. Uh, so I want to uh, okay enabled uh, Bala Subramaniam. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, uh, in the last slide, slide you said about deterministic QM. Hmm hmm hmm. Um, Determinism. Oh. Okay, and I attended a few weeks back a talk by Professor Gerard Atut. Mm -hmm. It 
it said about deterministic qm and cellular automation are there any connections between uh, okay so there are some very key differences from tooth theory the goal is the same uh but notice i did not set out looking for a deterministic theory underlying qm that was not my goal my goal was to look for a formulation for quantum theory without time you get that no that was the goal okay it to it so turns out that in when we solve that problem spontaneous localization and quantum indeterminism just fell out as a you know by product of the underlying deterministic theory there are two important differences from two firstly to my understanding he still has space time in his cellular automaton if i understand him right uh, i don't have space time at the planck scale the second very important difference is that i don't have a problem with quantum non locality you see there's no epr paradox because at the planck scale uh, we have in fact removed space time the concept of locality and non locality is gone at the planck scale you don't have space time so everything is in a sense non local if you want to do look at it that way whereas i think uh, to talk of uh, uh, bell inequalities being recovered in a statistical sense I, i don't know too much about this aspect of his work but this is the other uh, difference uh, how to deal with non locality okay so can you give us some more references to your work uh, if you please yeah. go to the last slide just go to my home page okay. all the references are given there Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, TP. A few people were asking uh, uh, that question. I'm not sure. Uh, Some time back, I was looking at uh, one of your papers, a recent one, whether mm -hmm. difference or not. But anyway, I think going to going to your uh, web page uh, will be probably the best, right? Yeah, yeah, because that will be the easiest. I guess yes. updating it. Uh, okay. Okay. All the papers are listed there. Listed there. Okay. okay thank you so sir. let us come back uh, to again uh, as i said faber both had still a couple of more questions left uh, the first one is i mean the next one rather is entanglement appears when there is a conserved quantity so what conserved quantity is entangled to iq oh i don't know if i understand the question maybe the speaker can come online if possible or write something uh by entanglement i just mean standard uh, the kind of quantum entanglement if the first icon is in a superposition of two states say 1a and 1b and the second icon is in a superposition of states 2a and 2b their entangled state would be uh q1a q2a plus q2a q2b in the standard quantum sense this state in the matrix dynamics becomes more and more unstable as you increase the number of entangled particles and hence when n the number of entangled particles becomes very large the state collapses to one of the superposition this is a property of this matrix dynamics okay um actually let us finish uh, just one more question that he kind of has uh just give me a second uh as you talk about coarse graining mm -hmm. a transport phenomena analogy with iq very good very good. excellent yes thank you for asking i would take the simple example of the brownian motion of a pollen grain in a glass of water which is the simplest kind of phenomenon try maybe you can if you like to think of it as a transport uh the pollen grains motion is actually not random yeah if we follow the molecular motion of the molecules of water they are hitting uh, the pollen uh, every now and then and if you knew could follow the newtonian mechanics of those molecules the pollen grains motion is perfectly deterministic yeah because you know it's just a result of collisions nothing random or unpredictable there however because we are not observing individual water molecules are uh, just looking at the water fluid then every now and then there comes an 
occasion when the pollen is hit by an asymmetric uh, number of molecules from different sides. So the collision's uh, effect is then asymmetric. So it feels a net force, the so-called uh, uh, drag. Yeah. So uh, it seems as if it's undergoing random motion, but that is a consequence of coarse graining and not observing at the resolution of molecules. Precisely in the same way, very precise analogy, the low energy quantum motion of an icon appears indeterministic under certain circumstances because you are not observing it at Planck scale resolution. So the claim is that the observed collapse of the wave function is a result of ignoring Planck scale physics. So yes, there's a very good analogy with uh, uh, fluids, uh, transport motion uh, equations. Okay. Uh, uh, we have a question from Sarvesh Gharat. Is he on the line? Sarvesh Gharat. Yeah. Can you, can you unmute and ask the question? Yeah, Sarvesh. So basically, I want to ask that why did you only just take the trace of a matrix like mm -hmm. just to make it scalar yeah uh -huh. that was the goal yeah this so is then, the def mm -hmm. go ahead then, then why can't we take the determinant of the same or something like that like why uh, only trace that is a very good point now the thing is that uh, this trace is similar to spirit in quantum mechanics like taking expectation values um so if you think of a diagonal matrix, the trace is the sum of the diagonal elements, which would also serve as eigenvalues. Yeah. Classical systems are realization of one or the other specific eigenvalues in the trace. So in that sense, classicality is very intimately related to traces of such a matrix, even in quantum theory. A determinant has so much uh, much more, uh, I don't know, more or less information. You could do that. You can make a theory with determinants of matrices. So, I mean, nothing against it. I have not thought about it. So, so basically, as we know, sum of trace of matrix is equal to sum of eigenvalues. So indirectly to relate it with eigenvalues, we yes. took that. Yes, that is, for me, that is a strong motivation. Uh, it helps you understand the quantum to classical transition. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, TP, we have a few more questions. I hope you. Yes, yes, I'm. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, there's one question from Tanmay Kumar Podar. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, please go ahead and Tanmay. Hello, sir. I, I'm audible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, so my question is that key. Uh, like when you define the action, uh, you write the action in terms of Q, uh, B and QS, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, since uh, like uh, the bosonic and permanent belongs from the different spaces, like bosonic space and the permanent space. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so like uh, one should write the action in terms of only Q, like how you pick the action. Uh, yeah, yeah. The good point is that Q is neither bosonic. Uh, did I go off or something? No, no, you are fine. Uh -huh. So Q is neither bosonic nor fermionic. Yeah. Uh, I want to be a little conventional. I don't want to have a Grassmann number valued action. We wanted the action to be bosonic and preferably a complex number. So if you notice the fermionic part QF comes multiplied with the fermionic matrix beta 1 or beta 2. You remember? <laughs> so beta 1 times QF is bosonic. The product of two fermionic matrices is uh, uh, bosonic. So QB plus beta 1 QF is bosonic. And so the trace is then can, can be a, a complex. Bosonic elements essentially behave like complex numbers. So uh, uh, in fact, we worked very hard to find this action. We took us about three, four months to realize that unless we introduce two new constant fermionic matrices, we can't make a self-consistent theory. So first we tried without beta 1, beta 2. Then we had just one matrix. Even that doesn't work. 
two matrices interestingly come make a consistent theory and you also notice it makes the object two dimensional in a sense yeah beta yes, 1 yes. and beta 2 cannot be equal so beta 1 is given the one dimension beta 2 is giving another dimension that is what makes this icon a lot like a closed string it's a two dimensional entity so you may have heard that uh, there is evidence that space time goes to two dimensions on the planck scale so we see that in the structure of our action it's very constrained okay okay uh, so then uh, we have come just to the penultimate question uh, so this is sir uh, sorry uh, arya deep are you there arya deep paul yeah i think you are there yeah oops sorry yeah one second yeah please okay. arya deep can yeah 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 so what are the drawbacks if any of this theory if ah drawbacks very good very good excellent thanks for asking <laughs> so firstly right now it is a euclidean theory uh namely that uh, the emergent space time is not minkowski it's you know you do you understand euclidean no yeah 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 yeah, yeah. euclidean theory the, the, we have been i didn't show it to you we we have to bring in dirac operators which are actually nothing but, but time derivative of qb qb dot is actually a dirac operator and uh, we borrowed a euclidean dirac operator from uh, alan cohn's non commutative geometry of course that is not uh, realistic uh, we have to go lorentzian so this is a euclidean not a lorentzian theory that is one drawback and then secondly according to me i need to we need to understand spin yeah we remember unless there is a good explanation for the origin of spin in this theory it's not a good theory and then most importantly it should make contact with the standard model of particle physics so recently we have been able to add gauge field so we have a unification of gravity gauge young mills gauge field and dirac fermions but does this uh, admit the standard model what's the connection with particle physics so we don't know that right now so if that doesn't come through uh then also you know it's it's not a good theory it may be a useful exercise but for it to be you know a physical theory it has to predict the world it has to predict the at least it has to show that it is consistent with the standard model of particle physics su3 plus su2 plus u1 we will work on that we haven't started looking at it yet okay thank you sir okay uh i said last two questions but there was Arnab, one yeah. uh, adnab uh, yeah can you please go ahead and ask your question adnab uh, yeah sure um so i had a question so how do you sorry sorry can you start again sorry um okay am i audible now yeah yeah, yeah. um so how do you uh, how do you like what do you think you are going to what's the way to test your theory Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, is it possible to share the screen? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go ahead again. What should I? Do? No, no. Is, is your uh, is it uh, much simpler if you want me to just do it in a second? Yeah, yeah. Do please okay. go to this slide number ten called predictions. Yeah. Can you okay. see? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. So, firstly, you see, we predicted spontaneous localization. We didn't add it by hand. So, if spontaneous localization, the GRW theory is confirmed by experiment, it is a support for our work. If it is ruled out, then this theory is also ruled out because uh, you know we predict spontaneous localization. If we don't see it, then this matrix anomaly is ruled out. Secondly, from the micro states of these icons at the Planck scale. you could actually derive the beckenstein hawking formula for black hole entropy for a schwarz child black hole uh, there's a paper on that so that's in a sense a consistency prediction then there is a uh, proposal that the dark energy the so called dark energy which is causing the acceleration of the universe is actually a large scale quantum gravitational phenomenon what i mean by that that there are a, a very large number of 
lightweight icons which have not undergone spontaneous localization they are quantum gravitational entities and they are the ones which are causing the classical universe to accelerate and uh, then we uh, provided a explanation recently for a very interesting fact if you know gyromagnetic ratio is defined as the ratio of the magnetic moment to the angular momentum of a uniformly charged rotating body and as you know in maxwell's electrodynamics the value for this g ratio is e by 2m for a dirac electron a dirac fermion in particular for electron you probably know this is twice the classical value you see by m what would you expect from a charged spinning black hole it's a classical object so one would naively at least expect its g ratio to be e by 2m but in gr it is known to be e by m the gyromagnetic ratio of a charged spinning black hole is the same as that of an electron that uh, to me is very puzzling we actually proved from this matrix dynamics that the two must be equal a black hole must must have the same gyromagnetic ratio as the electron there is a duality using which we can map solution of the dirac equation to solutions of einstein equations describing black holes so we we have a proof which i think is quite nice then there was a the last thing on that slide satya if you could go to the 10th slide i'm sorry uh, was it was it removed right then yeah sorry sir so yeah right so uh, the, the so called length uncertainty relation if you take a a uh, device to measure a length l there will always be a minimum uncertainty delta l given by this relation delta l is not planck length delta l grows with l this is a so called uh, holographic uncertainty relation known in the literature also as the caroli hartzi uncertainty relation but this is the first time we derived it from underlying theory and in principle if light detectors like ligo advanced ligo become more sensitive by another couple of orders of magnitude we can use the ligo arm lens to test this relation this is a very clean prediction if this relation is confirmed it is very strong evidence for the theory to be correct and if this is ruled out then again the theory will be ruled out hmm. um Uh, can i just ask one last thing actually there are still more questions oh, popped up that's fine that's fine i i can talk to you later sir it's fine oh, yeah, that will be great okay yeah. uh, i also see one more question from saikat uh, if you can very quickly ask and because we have still left one more question on youtube yeah please go ahead okay <clears throat> i mean uh, uh you can you motivate uh, about why uh, are you thinking dark energy as a large scale quantum yes, gravitational yes, phenomena yes 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 thank you i can do that yeah it is not put in by hand uh so firstly we derive this length relation you notice which i just mentioned yes yeah so this is a consequence of this relation that the observed universe has about 10 to the power 120 120 units of information if you think of each icon as one unit of information or each particle as one such unit there are 10 to the power 100 122 you know this number from the cosmological constant a 10 to the power 120 units of information but the observed universe only has about 10 to the power 90 particles even if we include cold dark matter you can see my point 10 to the power 120 yes. Versus 10 to the power 90. Where are those yes, other right. bits of information? So that is where I propose that there are extremely lightweight, non-entangled 10 to the power 120 icons, which are not the standard particle. It's a new particle, um, and it turns out that because it has a very low kinetic energy, its 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 Compton wavelength is of the order of the Hubble radius. so these uh, dark energy particles or icons that i have introduced their compton length is of the order of the hubble radius of the universe 
they're actually frozen. They're frozen into the universe. They have no kinetic energy. They're only a gravitational potential energy, which it is then easy to show behaves like a cosmological constant. The effective equation of state is that of a cosmological constant. The, and, but these are quantum gravitational objects. You, you cannot describe them by Einstein equation. They have to be described as these uh, icons. And uh, so, why, can, why, why, why is that necessary? Because you know, if the Compton length is of the order of the Hubble radius, there's no space time that it will see, right? Uh, normal uh, right. elementary particles live in a space time. This object is not living on space. It has a size of the order of the whole space time. So it's a quantum gravitational uh, entity and has the effective equation of state of a cosmological constant. And the main motivation was this uh, holographic uncertainty relation for lengths, which tells you that uh, the number of information bits grows as the area of the universe, not as its volume. And that gives you this 10 to the 120 information bits. And where are they? So that's the motivation. OK, so essentially, uh, you, uh, the dynamics is the cosmological constant driven dynamics, not yes. any modified theory. But you have a way to uh, I mean, describe the order of magnitude of the cosmological constant. Yes, and that is a purely, you know, it's a quantum gravitational effect. Yes, universe, yes, right. is the universe is not classical. The baryonic and the dark matter part of the universe has undergone spontaneous localization. That is classical. But these uh, dark energy icons are not classical. They have not undergone spontaneous localization. So if the theory is correct, then this is a likely explanation. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, so if you really I want to come to the last question, still there are some questions coming up, but uh, yeah, maybe I, they can just email me. Email, me. Yeah, so uh, this is a question from a very young participant, a school uh, uh, boy. Uh, so that should motivate you to yeah, talk, yeah. talk on uh, with that question. Uh, rather, I think his son writes, my son, Harman, uh, who is still at school, is very much interested in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Once if the universe will always keep expanding or will it stop and start contract? Oh, this is a very good question. <laughs> um, okay, uh, can I take a couple of minutes to uh, put this question in context? I mean, I mean yeah. I, I'm answering it from my theory's point of view. Okay, okay. Let's first ask this question, what caused the universe to even begin in the first place? What caused the Big Bang? I mean, if this theory is sensible, it has to answer that question. So uh, the most plausible explanation is that uh, fundamentally, the universe is actually a Hilbert space of icons. It's a mathematical, or you, want, you can call it physical. There's no space time in the universe. Then for some reason, around 13 billion years ago, a very large number of icons got entangled with each other, underwent extremely rapid spontaneous localization, which then led to an explosion, which is the reverse of spontaneous localization. The Big Bang is the opposite of collapse or localization to one point. And that's how the universe was created. Now, the opposite of this collapse is a Big Bang, which is why we are all there. And where are we headed? Uh, it turns out that spontaneous localization is an act of moving away from thermodynamic equilibrium. And the universe is now, in all these 13 billion years, trying to undo that spontaneous localization and return to equilibrium. So how does it do that? Eventually, it forms black holes. Uh, fortunately for us, the formation of black holes is halted with the formation of stars and planets, but there's a transitory process. Ultimately, everything becomes black holes. Uh, black holes undergo Hawking radiation, and that is a return to equilibrium. So when that return to equilibrium will happen, we'll, we'll all be icons once again. 
space time itself would have disappeared we'll be back to a hilbert space of icon so the entire question of will the expansion go on forever loses meaning because space time itself will again vanish we'll be back to the hilbert space and perhaps uh, all the time more and one or the other spontaneous localizations are always taking place in this hilbert space forming these so called multiverses you know many big bangs a big bang here and a big bang there and then the opposite of the big bang is to return to equilibrium it is a game between the hilbert space of icons and multiverses this is how i think of it i don't know if it's correct mm -hmm. this is my picture of um, yeah, okay universe <laughs> so tp so, it's a very nice uh, way to end uh, such a such an informative and also uh, uh, as i mentioned in the beginning a talk that was in a way a premiere of your uh, brand new theory so we are very happy to, to have been uh, hearing from you uh, today and uh, so on behalf of uh, all the participant uh, we would like to really thank uh, for this excellent talk and also engaging uh, with the participants for such such a long time and i think it was a it's great to kind of see a lot of discussion and uh, question yeah, thank you very much uh, my yeah. thanks to you and thank you to all the participants for asking these very nice questions it's really a pleasure a very stimulating occasion for me to to have your you your participation in this lecture thank you very much okay so uh, before i uh, close this session uh, today i once again as i always do just would like to flash uh, uh, the program uh, for the one second i hope i can see that quickly yes um, for the next week uh, which i would like to again uh, mention remember from 15th on 17th on 19th uh, monday wednesday and friday we have three more uh, scintillating talks uh, one by dr animesh chatterji one by uh, professor b s acharya and another one on 19th by professor patrick rasgupta so we once again invite you to come back and enjoy these uh, interactive lectures all at uh, 6 pm on the same zoom uh, uh, url and also of course the uh, youtube uh, live is all there available for all these talks okay so with that uh, now uh, that brings me to end of this today's event and once again uh, we thank uh, professor tp singh and uh, thank you very much for joining and until monday at 6 pm so take care and stay safe all of you yeah thank you bye bye thank you good night everyone